All right, thank you all for joining us tonight for our careers in med tech, life sciences and biotech panel. We have an excellent set of panelists with us tonight and we're incredibly grateful for them to offer their time to speak about their careers. Uh, we will begin shortly, but first I want to introduce Device Alliance to, the, to those of you who are not familiar and to share about our future events coming up. Just as housekeeping rules, you as the audience will be muted throughout the panel discussion just to prevent Zoom bombings, um, but feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. And if you have questions throughout the, the discussion, drop them um, in the chat as well. We'll pick them up and come back around to them towards the end of the panel discussion when we have our open Q&A. So just as a brief introduction, my name is Joanne. Um, I'm a biomedical engineering PhD student at UC Irvine. I chair the Young Professionals Committee for Device Alliance, um, which focuses on elevating the voices of our next generation leaders in the med tech industry. And this event is our second part of our seven part professional training development program. And it most certainly would not be possible without the help of Justin Ratzenwink, uh, Hari Jat Singh, Aaron Sangha, and Scott Johnson, the president of Device Alliance. So thank you so much for your support team. A little bit about Device Alliance. Um, we are the only nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of vitality for SoCal's medtech device community. Orange County is actually incredibly unique in that we, have, we are considered a central hub for the medical device diagnostic center as well as biopharmaceutical sector. Um, in 2013, we estimated about 14.7 billion um, in <laughs> economic activity. And that's obviously much greater now in 2020 and 2021 with what's going on with our current landscape. And we especially are supported by giant companies like Edwards, Medtronics, and the growing success of smaller, medium-sized companies like Exonics Modulation. Um, so because of that, we have quite a lot of different members from different uh, companies and whatnot. So that includes J&J, &J, Medtronic, uh, and the smaller ones of Dialdi, Microvention, C-Spine. Um, so if uh, you know these, if you haven't been to a Device Alliance event, welcome to the first one tonight. Um, our upcoming ones then are a virtual mixer with Bioscience, Bioscience LA as the LA uh, MedTech Week for Monday, March 8th. And then we also have some more uh, workshops for our young professional training development um, for career development, specifically in education versus experience, crafting a personal brand, resume building and acing interviews. Um, so all of that will be sent to you in an email afterwards. So don't worry about trying to get all of that written down yet. Um, so if you haven't heard of us or wanna learn more, uh, consider going to our website for devicealliance.org or connect with me um, at jly at uh, device alliance. And I can drop that into the chat here. And so we'll go ahead and get to the main part of the show now then. So we do have a lot of um, panelists and because uh, this is a panel for the career trajectory of all of our panelists, I'll leave more of the specifics to, our, to them to sort of share, but just to prime everyone here, I'll share at a high level overview of our very accomplished speakers and I will butcher their last name. So I, I apologize in, in, in preference. Um, so first we have Swarin uh, Kula Shakaran. And he earned his BS uh, in biomedical engineering from USC. He then worked at Medtronic, Abot, and now is at Sprig Consulting uh, to help med tech companies get to commercializations, specifically focusing on marketing and advertising. Next, we have Allison Olivia, who is one of the OGs. Um, we love her here at Device Alliance. She is a principal comprehensive clinical consultant. Uh, she serves as a senior clinical regulatory consultant supporting medical devices, uh, biologics, and the pharmaceutical industries. Next, we have Erin Sunga, who is also one of our key young professional committee leaders. So thank you so much for your help for uh, putting on these events. 
She earned her bachelor's in biomedical engineering at UC, Ir at UC Riverside, sorry, and her MBS in biotech management from the Keck Graduate Institute. She then worked uh, for Applied Medical Medtronic and did some freelancing and consultant. And today she is now a senior regulatory affairs specialist at Endologics. Next, we have Jacob Trudy, who earned his master's and BS in biomedical engineering from Cal Poly Pomona, um, San Luis Obispo. He worked at ABOT, Edwards Endologics, and now is the R&D engineering manager at MRE Medical. Deval Shaw earned his bachelor's in mechanical engineering, which is interesting um, from my perspective as a BME in the medical world. Uh, he started his career in actually non-medical and biotech industries like Southern California's Edison and then moved into the medical industry for with Vier uh, Medical and then now is a quality engineer level two at Edwards Life Sciences. Life, Life Sciences. And last but not least, another of our OG, Susan Bernowski. She it has held many senior directing and management positions for marketing sectors of household companies like Avod, Copper, Vision, Medtronic, and she's now an associate director for the cardiovascular marketing at Cytokinetics. Um, so that is our breath of our panel, very well accomplished, and we can go ahead and jump into our first question here while I go ahead and close uh, the screen share. So then um, in terms of the format, we will go around Robin and format where I'll ask each of the panelists and if they uh, have anything that they want to contribute, they can. If not, they can go ahead and skip and move on. But for the first two questions, uh, we can go ahead and start with Soren. Uh, can you describe a little bit and briefly what is sort of the purpose of your role in your company? Um, so who do you work with? Who do you serve? And sort of where does it play in for a med tech, biotech, or life science company? Yeah, of course. Um, so I work for Sprig Consulting now. Um, it's a boutique consulting firm that's been around for about 12 years now. Um, and basically what we do is we help grow companies, nurture new ideas and market products. But what that basically um, entails is working with startup and medium sized medical device companies to help get their ideas out the door. And that can mean a lot of different things. Um, some of my projects for early stage companies are similar to like market research, um, where we spend time talking to physicians um, or even other customers within hospitals and trying to understand what key value drivers um, would make them uh, like a product or would make their lives easier with a certain type of product. Um, I've done a lot of like investor um, support. So helping startup companies go to investors and show investors that their technology um, is worth investing in and is going to become a standard of care in the future. Um, I've done just press releases and helping companies tell their story about how they're growing in the marketplace, what direction they're going in and things like that. Um, and the more kind of tangible things for more commercialized products are working on product launches, um, really strategizing um, where best to launch new products um, in hospitals across the country. And lastly, even doing a like conference strategy of which conferences do we go to, um, what products are we trying to showcase there and things like that. So with Sprig, I work with multiple different clients and like I said, in many different um, stages of commercialization. Um, and it's great just because I can, I feel like I have an impact or have a, uh, the ability to see new devices that are coming out five to 10 to 15 years down the line. Um, and it's a very exciting role and absolutely one of my dream jobs as well. Um, so that's a kind of brief overview of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis um, as a marketing commercialization consultant. Thank you so much, Soren. Allison? This is Allison. I unmuted my phone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm on a variety of devices. So my role in the company is I own my own consulting firm. Um, I've done that for about 20 years, but I also spent 20 years in a variety of roles in the industry. And I started out in clinical research. I, I came from R&D. I went to clinical research. And along the way, I took on and gathered knowledge by taking on a variety of roles, including clinical quality and regulatory. My job serves my clients 
and the client companies I work for by providing clinical and regulatory strategic advice. Um, I start with, I work with a lot of startups and they often don't know where to go for questions and what to do first. Over the years, I've learned to apply some project management best practices to every project. And as the previous speaker said, I get to touch everything that's new and coming up. I've told other people, I have a 90-year-old mom now, go mom. And she always tells me, you better learn about that because I might need one of those. So that's my career in a nutshell. Uh, you know, that's one way to have your children work for you. <laughs> that's great, Allison. Thank you so much. Erin, um, what is the purpose of your role for your company? Hello, so my name is Erin Senga. I work in the Regulatory Affairs Department at Endologics in Irvine, California. Um, my department primarily works to maintain and launch our Class Three endovascular devices in the US, EU, and international markets. Um, on a daily basis, I work primarily with cross-functional teams, including R&D, manufacturing, clinical affairs, and project management, especially when there are changes to our products, manufacturing process, suppliers, anything that changes, we have to usually have put a project together. Um, I also get to communicate with regulatory bodies, such as the FDA and notified bodies in the EU, um, to make sure we're all aligned on our submissions. Um, so mainly maintaining and launching products across the globe is what we do. That's awesome. Thank you, Erin. Jacob, can you share what your role is for your company? Sure. Yeah. So I work for Inari Medical and, uh, and I am the R&D engineering manager. Uh, the purpose of my role is to um, basically develop products. So that includes early stage voice of customer research with physicians and with uh, different uh, stakeholders, uh, interfacing a lot with uh, the marketing group to kind of see where the key drivers in the industry are going. Uh, then ultimately interfacing with other R&D personnel to develop products, figure out how to develop those products, what kind of equipment, tooling, manufacturing we need to make whatever will meet the market needs. And then downstream interface with regulatory, manufacturing, quality groups, and, uh, and just about anyone who wants to get involved. So it, it, we do definitely touch pretty much every group at some point throughout the um, design control process. Thank you, Jake. Oh, yep. did you wanna add anything? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Deval? Hi, my name is Deval Shah and I'm working at Edwards Life Sciences right now. I'm a quality engineer um, within the pilot operations uh, organization. So as pilot operations, what we do as a department is um, take a product coming directly from R&D, um, new product development and support it all the way throughout until that product transfers into a commercial plant. So um, we're there for the very early on, the early prototype phases of a potential product all the way throughout the clinical studies for the product that um, that happen. And within the department, I am in receiving inspection. So um, whenever we get parts coming from our suppliers, um, we have our team who inspects those parts. And anytime issues arises, quality, quality issues or any other types of um, roadblocks that arises is when I'm typically called on to um, remove those roadblocks for the team to continue inspecting or to um, change what they're doing, um, take a look at the different um, scenarios that could be happening. Um, in, in my role, I get to cross-function um, with a lot of different roles, early on R&D as well as um, kind of on the commercial side um, with manufacturing engineers and um, buyers planners in the supply chain as well. So um, that's a little bit of what I do. Thank you, that's awesome. And last but certainly not least, Susan. Hi, once again, I'm Susan Baranowski. I currently work with Cytokinetics. I am the Associate Director for Cardiovascular Marketing. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people just assume marketing is making pretty pictures and I'm, I'm here to, to completely bust that myth 
if I may, I see Swar, I'm laughing about it because uh, there's there's a whole bunch of work that goes into bringing a product to market. And that's where we are right now. Cytokinetics is a pre-commercialization company. They're, uh, it's an interesting model. They're like a 20 year old startup. They've had a number of products and now we are the closest right now to commercializing a product. And, and what that means is that there's a tremendous amount of strategic work that needs to be done to understand who our patients are, who our target audience is, understanding some of the core elements of branding, of positioning, messaging, um, all of the elements that you need to bring a product to market. And it's it's a, uh, a role that certainly works very closely with a number of the functional groups within the commercialization team. But we also work very broadly with our clinical colleagues, with regulatory affairs, um, with folks that work in payers and uh, health economics and research and things like that, and very closely with our marketing, um, excuse me, with our market research colleagues. So it's it's a, an, an, a fascinating opportunity for me. Most of my experience had been in really large companies. I've worked for Merck, Pfizer, most recently have been working for Medtronic. And so it's an interesting change to, uh, to go from a large company to this uh, smaller model that you really do get a chance to feel like you're touching every aspect of the product launch. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, from what I'm hearing from everyone, you know, all of the roles are interconnected regardless of where you end up. Um, and it's all contributing to the main product of being able to save a person's life in some way or form or to touch someone's life in some way or form. Thank you, panelists. Um, so moving on to more of a qualitative perspective about your career trajectory, um, something that a lot of individuals, including myself, had assumed is that it's career is very linear and that's not always true. Um, if you're lucky, it might be, but um, I have found that it is not true for many individuals that I've spoken with. Can you go ahead and share about how you found yourself in your career, sort of the trajectory that you were on and how do you know if it was the one that you wanted to stay in or do you wanna leave it? Um, and sort of sort of the, quali the qualitative aspects of that. We can go ahead and start with Susan and we can go backwards from the order that we had previously. Oh, great. That's a, it's a great question. And in, in many ways, I feel like I backed into my current role, but I'm completely happy with it. Um, so I was originally a biological sciences major, was really thinking about, you know, what was I going to do once I left school? Wasn't interested in going on and, and doing the advanced degrees. Um, but I had always worked in retail and I thought, well, what's a way to combine uh, a science background and a sales capacity? So I started with pharmaceutical sales and did that for a few years. And I think it's actually some of the best experience that I've ever had because it gave me a chance to really understand what it's like to interact with physicians and understanding my customers' needs. I had the opportunity to advance in my career, taking on some marketing roles, and then made a big leap into to working for medical advertising agencies. And I did that for eight years. And frankly, that's one of the best moves I could have made because it made me understand what it's like to be a brand steward and to understand all the components of bringing a product to market. From there, I moved back to working on the client side and I can't imagine doing anything else in the healthcare industry that I like more than what I'm doing. It's important to me to feel like I'm making a difference for patients. And particularly when I was uh, working for Medtronic, we had a lot of opportunities to go into the OR and watch cases and you knew you were touching patient, patients. And now I have friends that have heart failure, which is the product that we're working in family members that have worked uh, for many of the folks of our organization that have passed from heart failure. So for me, it's very meaningful to work in a, in a category that is going to change a patient's life. So I, I feel very fortunate to have had the, the pathway um, and don't see a need to change it. That's fantastic, thank you. Deval, can you share about how you got to where you are and what are you looking for in the future? Sure. So as you mentioned a little bit, Joanne, I do have a little bit of a different background. Uh, I was a mechanical engineering major, and then I ended up somehow in the medical device industry. Um, but initially early on, um, when I was still at um, getting my undergraduate degree, I was um, in a various different types of roles. I was in the refrigeration industry and then um, the public sector as well. But I never really seemed to find that calling um, in any of those roles until I did, a, I did my senior design project in the biomedical um, field, which is where I really um, figured that that was something that I really liked. And that was something that I wanted to do coming out of 
um, undergraduate school. And um, having gone to school in Irvine, I wanted to stay local and within Orange County. So no better industry to set my foot in other than the medical device industry. So um, that's kind of how I started. And then I started in as an R&D engineer. Um, that was my first role and eventually made my, uh, made my way into quality essentially because um, the way, like essentially because at the end of the day, the quality of the products that we work on is very crucial because things end up in someone's body for a long amount of time or, um, or things like that. So um, that's kind of how I ended up where I am now. And then the sense of purpose is just being able to work on something that directly impacts so many people around the world and being able to help patients um, and see the improvement that my work brings in their life. It's, it's just something that never gets old. Um, and, and I think it's going to continue to keep driving me within this industry. Thank you. I'm hearing a trend, a trend starting of this passion of being able to touch lives um, with your job and that's fulfilling in itself. Thank you. Jacob, can you share about um, how you found yourself in your career and how did you know it's the one or where do you want to go in the future? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, you know, I always had a five-year plan and every year it changed. So uh, I think that's typical. Um, you know, you kind of set a direction and adjust course um, as needed. Uh, the way I found in myself in my current role is I always wanted to develop products. That's kind of what tickled my brain. And that's what really gets me excited, um, you know, in the morning to go to work. Uh, I did start my, my, uh, my career out in quality, actually, at uh, Abbott Laboratories. Uh, and it was a great, uh, great experience, uh, just understanding the quality. And as Deval mentioned, it's, you know, it's, it's the product. So, uh, you know, big tip of the hat to that. Uh, but, but ultimately, I wanted to go to, to product development and um, kind of looked for the roles, the right roles that opened up for that um, and, uh, and jumped on over. Uh, I found myself at an RE Medical um, when uh, just uh, this opportunity opened up. Inari is a very rapidly growing company uh, and it's very focused on uh, developing products. We, uh, we are in the Venus space, which, uh, you know, it's been ignored by the industry for the last 20, 30 years. Um, we focused on arterial and forgot about the other side of the cardiovascular system. Uh, so uh, there, there's special disease states and with that special tools that need to be developed for that. So um, I ended up here because I saw the opportunity that there, there, there's a lot of unmet needs here. Uh, and, uh, and you know, as of right now, I, I am in my dream job. I, I'm doing developing products and, uh, you know, and, and uh, working closely with physicians. So uh, like I said, it's, it's uh, you, set, you have a five-year plan, but you adjust as needed. Uh, it's very similar to surfing where uh, you need to know how to learn to surf, but you also got to wait for the right wave to get there. So, uh, and you, you can't surf if no wave comes, but also uh, if a wave comes and you don't know how to surf, you're going to miss that as well, so. That sounds like you took opportunities when it was there. Thank you, Jacob. Erin, can you share about how you found yourself in your career? Yeah, sure. So I definitely did not dream of being in regulatory affairs. You don't just grow up thinking, oh my gosh, I want to be in regulatory affairs. And it definitely was not on my radar of a potential career path while in college. It's not something that they really teach you when you're in engineering. Um, it wasn't really until I attended graduate school when I became more aware of regulatory affairs. That's when we had to take actual classes in regulatory affairs. And this is something that's a little bit more specific to the life sciences because you do need to make sure you get your products approved in different countries in order to actually sell. Um, so I was originally planning to be in biotech management or business development or some type of consulting, but I ended up finding myself in an internship in regulatory affairs. Um, and then from there, I met Allison, which is also on the panel, and she encouraged me and offered a lot of career advice um, in regulatory affairs. Um, so now I find myself three years in, um, but I'm still pretty new in my career and early in my career, so who knows where it might take me. Um, right now, I'm definitely um, on that regulatory affairs career path. 
Um, but people always uh, share their career uh, positions and everything else seems really exciting. So you never know. Um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Thank you, Erin. And Erin is actually one of our like star child of so device alliance meeting connections there and being able to build her career um, and find herself a position there so thank you Erin. Um, speaking of Allison, Allison can you please share how you found yourself where you are today? Okay sorry we're on multiple devices here. Um, like Jacob I had a five-year plan. Unlike Jacob mine was to move to Hawaii and live there. That didn't turn out so good. I actually considered doing graduate work there and my father put the kibosh on that right away. Um, but I always had an interest in the tropics and I found a laboratory that was working in plant biology, plant sciences, because I never wanted to cut up little animals or people, which is why I was trying to avoid medical school. That didn't work out the way I planned. So, but I found this lab and I was growing endangered species of orchids and doing other USDA supported research. So you got to remember, this is in the grassroots day of conservation. And I was very interested in that. I almost did an ecology degree in um, plant chemistry. But I continued on with this professor that I liked very much and thought, gee, I don't really want to work in a lab. And he offered me an internship at what was then Allergan. And I don't know how many of you know, but the founder of Allergan is very interested in plant sciences. And so I was growing plants in a greenhouse behind the original building at Allergan. And I had an opportunity to work in industry and maybe foolishly, I stayed in academia for another five years, but I got to work at the Beckman Laser Institute. So for five years, sort of in a startup environment, I went from basic research to applied research and got to work with Nobel Peace Prize winners from all over the world. We did the coolest things there. I tell people I've lasered everything from a tomato to a Jupiter moon sample. And this really appealed to me because it was teaching others how to use the same products we were using, and we were literally on the cutting edge. And while I was there, I learned a lot of tissue specimens and microscopy techniques and sort of got invited to join industry. And so I first went to industry in R&D and then later went back to industry in a clinical affairs position because, quite frankly, I was just tired of the lab. And that was sort of the opening of the door for me. My first role in clinical affairs was the do everything go for. Um, it's called a clinical research associate. We were called clinical scientists, but it's basically the design setup and execution of taking those products that some of us in R and D have developed and testing it in the human body. So again, that goes back to, I wanted to do something that was good. When I was at Beckman Laser Institute, we had money from the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, which was designed to kill people. Well, they were, they were forced by Congress to give a very small percentage of their money to the opposite of those objectives. So I got to work on those with those money. And once I got into clinical research, it was sort of a perfect confluence of my natural organization and ability to multitask. I don't know if it's the female brain that has that connection, but, um, and some attention to detail. And my career sort of grew from there. I worked in mid-sized companies, mostly the manufacturer. I went on to work at a clinical research organization. And then shortly after that, I went out on my own as a consultant in my own firm. Like some of the other speakers I forgot to mention in my intro, my job touches everybody in the company. I might talk to the complaint specialist one day and the CEO the next day. And my job is to really collate all the information I have and help the company develop the appropriate strategy. And I call it clinical regulatory, but of course our stakeholders are marketing and business objectives. When are we going to get to ROI? 
So it's fascinating, like I said, to apply business practices like project management to every single project and see how we can successfully launch into the marketplace. And of course, many of you now know that we have post-market requirements. So I like to say it's never over till it's over. And even then it's not over. And that's why I'm still working because it's never over. <laughs> so that's, that's how my career didn't sort of zigzagged a little bit, but I think I've been true to myself as far as organization, interactions. Um, I love going out in the field. I love attending cases. I like to work with the engineers because I want to know how that product could fail before I put it in a human being. So it's very important for me to touch all those levels in the company in order to achieve those business successes. That's great. Allison, thank you so much. You, I'm always amazed every time I hear about your, your work history. Soren, can you please share about how you found yourself in your current career or your position and where do you intend to go? Sure. Um, so to start off, like my background is in engineering, but as you can kind of tell from the previous conversations, I'm no longer an engineering person. But I think going through that process of when I was a biomedical engineering major at USC, similar to what Aaron was saying earlier, it was very much in, if you're an engineer, you go R&D, R&D, R&D. They kind of implant in that into your head. So I came out of college and I tried to look for an R&D job. And those jobs are very hard to get, actually. So I started off in manufacturing. And uh, honestly, to this day, my biggest um, kind of piece of advice for people that want to do engineering is start off in manufacturing. It's easy to get positions there. It's very difficult. They're going to throw you into the fire. And after a year or two of that, you're going to be able to do whatever you want. Um, so starting off, I came out of uh, my undergrad, got a manufacturing engineering position at Medtronic in Irvine, spent two years there, and I really decided I don't know if I'm an engineer. Like I was pretty successful in the role, but I just didn't know if that was me. So I said, all right, let me try one more engineering role before I either try to jump into an MBA program or try to get a marketing role. So I jumped out to Abbott. I wanted to try a new company. I wanted to try a new division, new therapy state. I really wanted to completely switch it up, but still have an engineering position. And I was lucky because I was on a combination product, which is a drug medical device combination um, at Abbott uh, Cardiac Rhythm Management up in LA. And that was a great experience, but at the end of my two years there, I was not an engineer. I was basically effectively a product manager in that role, running the engineering side of things. And that's when I really told myself like, okay, I need to make the jump to either marketing or an MBA program, applied to a couple of schools. And I was very, very fortunate enough and to convince a marketing manager up in Abbott Vascular in the Bay Area um, to take on basically an engineering, a young engineering kid. Um, into a marketing role. Um, and that experience was great because I had to convince him that I really wanted that role, that I could be successful at it. And I knew what it entailed. And that really came from talking to a lot of different people that were in marketing product manager roles. And I wouldn't have been able to make that jump from engineering to marketing without having talked to multiple people across the board and multiple companies, multiple states of life and everything else. So uh, as you can kind of see, like when I was jumping around, now I look back and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Like I went from one to the next to the next. But at the time I was just winging it and arguably I still am, but it's, uh, it's okay to kind of figure it out as you go and maybe look back and be like, oh, every decision I made made sense. Um, but again, my biggest recommendation for people that are looking for engineering roles, especially if you're straight out of college, is try to get those manufacturing engineering positions, those quality uh, engineering positions like Jacob got um, out of college. Those are great development opportunities. They're a lot easier to get than maybe your dream role, but they will help you get there. Thank you, Soren. That's great. And I love that you provided a lot of context as to I knew I wanted to do this. So these are the steps that I took and, you know, going through those hoops and making sure that you get your foot into the door and then, you know, have that opportunity to explore. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our next question then. Um, so now you're welcome to jump in if you like in terms of or to add or to skip if you feel like someone else has already uh, explained enough. Um, so we're going to jump to what skills 
you have developed on the way either during your career or even now in your current position um, that helps serve you and for, help serve you to be successful, but also help serve you in terms of making you stand out from the crowd um, that, you know, individuals who are interested, what kinds of skills should they develop to be in that position? Uh, we can go ahead and start back uh, with Susan. So I think, I, I, I think Swan really mentioned some interesting things about understanding that he was really clear about what he didn't want to do and open to exploring what he might want to do. And I think that that's really important is knowing what your interests are, but also to be very aware of what your fundamental skills are. I think this is always one of the biggest challenges when people start thinking about, I'm coming out of school, how do I get into a job? I'm changing careers, how do I go to a new role? And I think it's always important to understand functionally what you like and what you want to do. And then also try to find the job that matches with that. But I think, I think what's been very important for me is that I'm very comfortable asking people things. I'm comfortable saying, no, I don't understand that. Can you explain it to me? I think there's a lot of things that are just basic communication skills that serve people well in any job. And um, I think I've been successful because I've been able to be, be able to engage with a lot of people. All of us have talked about um, having to deal on a cross-functional basis. And frankly, talking to some of my pocket protector R&D gang might be a little bit different than talking to some of the, like the commercial leadership team. Um, so I think it's being able to understand how to communicate, no disrespect to my engineering friends, uh, but to, I think it's important to understand how to communicate and understand different audiences. And I think then being really clear, if you're looking at moving forward, what is it that you're interested in? How can you leverage that into a new role? And and I think also being open, I think that Jacob did a really good uh, analogy of saying it's like catching, it's surfing. It may not be the right wave right now, but the right one will come along. And I think you have to kind of open yourself to the universe that that might happen. I don't know anybody that has followed exactly the linear path um, that they thought they were going to do right out of school. I just think it's being open to it. So sorry for the ramble. No, you're fine. So speaking on communication skills and then also, you know, being patient and interested, um, curious, if anything, and knowing sort of the general direction where you're going, but, you know, you're not gung-ho about one thing only. Great. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to say, Susan, you really hit it on the head. Um, a lot of times if you're coming out of school, you, especially in a graduate program, You've been so focused on one topic and sometimes an esoteric topic, depending on your graduate level. And you don't necessarily take the time to say, what are my core skills? Am I good at walking around and talking to people? Am I afraid to ask questions? And we talk about this all the time. Pick a good match. It may be nothing like you thought it was going to be. No one knew what to do with me because I was a biology major that didn't want to go to medical school. And so, and I never wanted to work in the lab. And I told my professor that, well, turns out I was good at working in the lab. Um, I'm a very good tasker um, and I had to learn other skills. So I would say as you pick jobs or look for jobs, look for something that you already have skills but always look for something that stretches you, okay? Something you don't know, because otherwise it's not going to be interesting if you do the same thing over and over again. And I think, Erin, you learned that in some of the challenges. I will say the other people coming out of school or changing careers, what I've recommended is a documentation job. So, Erin, you had that. It was boring as heck, but you learned the fundamentals, right? And the next time you went to look for something, you knew exactly what was missing from that dossier. So if you have an opportunity and you go into quality, and I'm not saying be, be in complaints, be an analyst, um, but I do know, again, also working cross-functionally, I was so lucky. When I was the regulatory representative, I would go into these engineers and go, look, my boyfriend's an engineer, okay? I speak engineering. Here's what you have to do. So it is important to, to spread your wings and have that cross-functional experience. I just wanted to pop in, Susan, because you said it so eloquently. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. If I could just jump back for just a moment, I think getting back into that, I think it is a very big, it's like, how do you make the leap from being in, edu in an educational situation to being in industry? And I can share my own experience, whether it was when I started a job or any time I've worked for a new job, is that I looked at the job description and went through and tried to identify what are some of the functional skills and could I match my skill set up? Because I wanted to be able to have that conversation with that in interviewer that, look, I may not have done that job, but let me tell you about the five other jobs that I've the experiences that I've had that can apply to it. And I think that really helped because why was somebody going to hire me from the pharmaceutical industry when basically I had been just doing basic biology? But I was able to say, look, I have the science skills, I have the communication skills. Um, and the interest in being able to move forward. So I think, I think, I think you're really right, Allison. I think you have to to leap at opportunities that you have because it's like dating. You know, you might find the right date, and you might say that's the kind of person I never want to date again. Oh, that's great. That's a great analogy. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Allison. I, I I was just going to say, Susan, that I said that to a CEO once. I went on a job interview. I had good matching skills, and he said, great, when can you start? And I said, well, I'm finishing up a project with this other job. And he says, no, I need you right away. And I said, well, wouldn't you like to date a little bit before we jump into bed? And he said, no. He said, let's hit the sheet. So that all not only told me the situation, how he, what his MO was, but it also told me that maybe that wasn't a good fit for me, since I was a little more on the dating side than the hookup side. These analogies are amazing. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Does anyone want to hop in on commenting here? Yeah, sure. I can probably kind of go off of what Allison was kind of alluding to earlier. Um, so my first role out of graduate school was um, an associate international affair, regulatory affairs specialist. So and it was a contract role. So it was very task oriented. It was more like you do this, 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 and this, and that's it. Um, it was like, I got to learn a lot because it was my first job right out of call, out of graduate school. So I still learned a lot. Um, but it, once I kind of hit my like max and I started to plateau is when I was like, okay, I need something a little bit more challenging. Um, and that's where like Allison was saying, like I was able to find like, okay, this is what's missing for my job right now. And so for me personally, the contract obviously wasn't what I needed. I needed something that was more permanent so that I can actually be more involved in the company. And then I also um, didn't really enjoy the international side of regulatory affairs um, because like most companies, they usually go into the US or the EU first. And um, so those are the regions where most of the innovating and actual submission writing and actual strategy is within um, so it's usually us and the eu and then they go into other international markets um, and then with the international markets they usually leverage what was already existing for the us and the eu submissions so it's all it's a great place to start so if you're trying to look, get into regulatory affairs um, international is a great place um, at least for the roles that i've seen they don't require as much experience as in on the us and the eu side uh, so for me personally, it didn't, wasn't really what I was looking for, but it was definitely a good stepping stone and a good place to start. Great. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Jacob, did you want to add anything in terms of skills? Um, you know, uh, skills, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, maybe more of a quality, but it's, uh, really to take advantage of, of every job that you do have, you, you know, especially on the road to wherever you want to go. Um, and, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, every job you have is an investment of time, uh, of your time. And if uh, you don't invest it properly, uh, or if you do invest it properly, you might actually get a lot more back from that than just your salary or wage. Uh, and kind of where I'm getting at is, there's been many times in my career where I um, look back at a prior job I had or an experience, and I'm like, man, I wish I had just paid a little bit more attention to this or that, or, or done just a little bit more in depth in this project, even though maybe it was not my favorite at that time and I wanted to just finish it. Uh, but like, you know, the industry, no matter wherever you go in the industry, 
uh, it's a lot of things that repeat themselves. A lot of examples that you can take from your prior experiences and put it forward. So um, you'll be, you know, I, I've been very surprised how often things from my past have come back. Uh, and uh, and so, so, so my, my kind of the, the skill would be to really, you know, be passionate about that, your current job and, and really, you know, take advantage of it. Because again, it's not just for right now, not just for your salary, it'll really pay off in the future, even if it's outside of med tech. That's great. I'm hearing a lot of being able to sell yourself and sell your skills that you've picked up, whether you chose to or not. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Swarin, did you want to add anything to skills yeah. that you've developed? I think these are a little different type of skills, um, but two things that I think helped me a lot in my career um, were being able to reflect on past experiences. Um, and second is just being willing to do things that you might fail in. Um, and taking chances on things. So that reflecting aspect was very important to kind of all the points that were discussed earlier in terms of being able to look back at class projects or a time when you were hanging out with a couple of friends and you, know, you planned a trip or something like that to see how you go about decisions, to see how you deal with people being uh, a little difficult to work with, things like that. Um, taking that time to look back and think about how you acted in those situations is going to help you with all the things that were discussed earlier. And the second thing of willingness to fail is, um, like as has been said before, no one has a linear path and you're going to have to take some chances on yourself um, and really put bets on yourself and be willing to say like, hey, this might not work out, but I'm going to try it and see what happens. And worst case, I'll pick myself up and move forward. Thank you, Soren. Deval, did you have anything that you wanted to add in terms of skills? Um, just two things, really, um, especially within a quality role. Um, a lot of the times, what I at least realize right now is um, me having to explain the point of view that I'm coming from, uh, from the quality standpoint. Um, so being able to develop the communication skill set and also being able to work with um, a lot of diverse people in a, in a cross-functional group setting um, and, uh, and having the ability to get your point across um, in turn, and, and making sure that all the whole audience understands what you're trying to convey. Um, I think those two skill sets are, are something that is very important in, in regardless of the role that you, you go into. Um, so those two things is something that I would say. Thank you. That's great. I hear a lot of emphasis on communication and skills that you normally wouldn't expect to have that you end up having and they becoming they become very useful for you regardless of the role that you find. Um, so we can go ahead and transition to our um, audience questions as well as questions that we received from our uh, RSVP form. Um, so one that we just received from Scott earlier, and I know you all kind of touched on this already, but if you have you know, another thought in mind, um, if you could go back and give one piece of advice to your younger self in school, what advice would you give yourself? And anyone can hop on to it. I guess I can start. I have a lot of things that I wish I did and did not do in college. Um, so in college, I kind of spread myself a little too thin. I was in a sorority. I was in two engineering organizations. I was an engineering general. Um, and then I was also the senator at my school for the engineering college. Um, so I just really spread myself thin um, throughout the school year, over the summers and everything. Um, so I never actually got an internship while I was an undergrad. Um, so that's something that I always tell people is like, try to get an internship when you're in college, because that was something that made it really difficult for me to then find a job after graduation, because I had no idea what I even wanted to do. I didn't even know what kind of roles to look for, because I only had four years of schooling, and that's all I had on my resume besides projects. Um, so that's something that even if you get a, an internship that you absolutely hate, like at least you now know that you don't want to do that. <laughs> Um, so kind of just like crosses something off that list of who knows how many different job descriptions and different positions that are open to you because you're brand new to the industry. So definitely try to get as many internships as possible. 
So piggy, piggybacking off of what Aaron said, um, you know, trying out different things, uh, whether you like it or not, you won't know unless you try it. But similarly to that, I think um, I would say try to talk to as many people as you can within the different roles, because once you talk to people, you, you'll really understand what they're doing in the day to day life and see if you picture yourself in that sort of a role in the future. If you do, then, you know, that's one step closer to you trying to figure out if you want to try that or not. So that's one thing that if I could go back, I would probably tell myself. I think for myself, it's it's similar to what I was saying. It's, uh, you know, I, I, went into, I went into the sciences because I love the sciences. I'd originally thought I would go on to be a vet. And for a lot of reasons, I opted not to go that route. Um, but I think it, it was that I was open to other things. And frankly, and when I was exposed mm. to the idea of doing professional sales, I really balked at it because I had this vision of somebody being a car salesman or insurance salesman. Not that that is a, a bad role, but I think that there is a generalization of what comes with that. And um, when I started really investigating and in getting into professional sales, I thought this is very different than what my career has been. Maybe this is a step and a bridge to getting some experience. So I think for myself, if I were to go back and look at it again, I would realize that I needed to be open to what my future might be. There's a reason why I got into the education because there's a core element of it that I really liked. I love being in the sciences now, um, but I, it's a very different path than I would have ever anticipated. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else wanna jump in on you know advice to your former self as a student? I was just going to add into that, this is Allison, that um, when I did move to Hawaii, I worked in retail because that's something I had done during college to make money. I had a second job, even though I had a full-time job. And the women that I worked with in my store said they didn't like it because I knew how to talk to everybody. That was a skill I had to learn. Not only was I a little bit older than they were, but I had a really good boss who's still a mentor these many years later. And I used to trail around at meetings behind her and she would stick out her hand and introduce herself and then introduce me. And it gives me great pleasure that I've been able to do that with some Device Alliance members and some OCRA members. It's something I always remember and it's something that was a, a learned skill. So just put yourself out there. It's scary as heck, but once you do it a couple of times, you know, they'll either remember you or they won't, but at least you've done it now. Um, and I'll tell you, it serves me very well when I was a sales supervisor, albeit selling flip-flops in Hawaii. Our store went from last out of 13 to first out of 23. And I give credit to my first clinical and regulatory manager for helping me learn those skills. Thank you, Allison. We can go ahead and move on to another question from Carolina. I know, um, Allison, you kind of already addressed this, but I'm curious to hear from you know Susan and Swarin, um, and maybe even Jacob. Uh, my brain, anyways, <laughs> from everyone else who would be in hiring positions. Um, how, how does it look to have a resume continue to jump from company to company? Is that acceptable or is that something that you should be concerned about? I think I'll start off with this one. Um, and I'm actually going to try to answer two questions at once. Um, also the one about starting at a small company or a large company, since that also kind of ties into it. But my opinion is that it doesn't matter whether you go to a large company first or a small company first in terms of your resume progression, as long as you're able to uh, tell a story about what you've done. Um, and if you are only with a company for six months, that's perfectly fine. If you're able to say, well, to the next hiring manager, hey, like they only had a project that was going on for six months, but I was only there for a little bit and I learned this, 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 and this. And this is why I'm valuable to you. But if you were to just go to them and be like, oh yeah, I was there for six months, like whatever, and kind of move on, it, it shows um, just an ingenuine type of feel to it. So it's perfectly fine to stay in a role for six months um, as long as you walk away with something that's very important um, and that's marketable. 
Um, so to answer the question about the large company or the small company, I personally think that it's great starting off at large companies um, just because their development programs are, are uh, kind of put together very well to help you start thinking in a certain way. But that being said, it's not the worst thing to start off in a startup because you're thrown into the fire and you figure it out. And that is way better than any learning program can ever teach you. So it's not a right or wrong. It's very much of what you prefer to do. I started off at large companies and now I'm working with startups and that worked out very well for me. But I know people that have done the opposite and have, have had great experiences that way. Um, so it's not really a right or wrong. It's just what you do. One thing I do want to add on there is that if you start off at the large company route, you jump into smaller companies down the line within like 10 years or so and vice versa so that you get both uh, kind of aspects to it. You don't want to be, you know, 20, 30 years into your career and only have been at a startup or have only been in large companies. So it's nice to get that diversity. So I hope I answered both of those questions there. Susan? There we go. You know, uh, Soren, I think you raised a really interesting question about uh, moving from job to job. I started my career when you got into a company and you stayed there forever. And as I moved through different roles, I felt really uncomfortable either that I left because of relocation and I couldn't take my job or I left because I was wanting to find a new role. And, and I do think I have a slightly different perspective on yours versus the six month route. I think maybe when you're starting and you're trying to get experience and you're learning, I think your, your, your feedback is spot on. Be able to explain what you learned and how you can help that new employer is important. I think the one thing is you start to get in that I'm finding as, as we start to hire more senior roles, I want to make sure that somebody has been in there long enough that they're entrenched in it because it costs an organization a lot of money to bring people in and to bring them on board. And I don't think you want to stay so long that you don't look fresh or able to adapt to a new organization. But I think it's also important to show that you're willing to come in and be committed and, and do what needs to be done. And I think your point's really well point taken as far in that you need to be able to explain why you've gone from role to role and what is it that you can bring forward to your new perspective, to the new position. Thank you, Susan. Did anyone else want to jump in on? Um... Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that a little bit. I, I think that diversity of skill sets and experiences is, is a strength. Um, that is to say, you can also do that by staying in within one company. So that doesn't mean that you, can't, you have to jump company to company. Uh, especially bigger companies do present an easier path to switch different departments, switch different groups. Uh, just like Swaroon was able to switch to marketing from engineering. Um, so, uh, so that is definitely, you know, kind of having that diversity of skills is great. Uh, I will say that um, having too many short stints does put, you know, you possibly at a disadvantage versus someone who maybe had more complete projects. Uh, and, and the key word is complete projects. The medical device industry does have a longer turnaround time for, uh, you know, projects to get completed typically. Uh, and I might be more talking from the R&D point of view. Uh, so if you, I, for example, my perspective is if I see someone always jumping in the middle of a project and leaving in the middle of a project and never getting the full experience, that to me is a disadvantage over a candidate who maybe saw the entire design life cycle. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Deval, Aaron, do you want to hop in on this? Sorry, you're good. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, this is Allison. I worked in the Bay Area during the dot-com boom. And in the internet industry, people change jobs every six months because companies were willing to pay them a $20,000 bonus, signing bonus. I was very uncomfortable with that. And I had to change jobs because the startup was running out of money. I laughed when Swarn said, if you're at a startup for 30 years. Uh, so I went through a series of little hops that made me very uncomfortable. Um, even though I had been in multiple laboratories, I had always been under one University of California umbrella. Um, but I was able to show uh, that 
the change, the reason for the change. I mean, if you say the CFO said we're running out of money, um, but by that time in my career, like Jacob said, I also had been through the product life cycle. So I'm not, I am not in any way promoting that you only stay six months. I'm saying you only know a company and whether you fit there if you stay there for the first six months. Thank you, Allison. Deval, Aaron? Deval? Um, nothing, nothing for me to add on this one. Um, I guess on my two cents on like the large versus the small company, I started a, a larger company, Medtronic, right out of a grad school. Um, and within eight months, I felt myself being kind of pigeonholed and doing the same task over and over again. Um, it could have just been that role that I was within because it was like the bottom of the totem pole type of role. Um, so it just didn't fit me. Um, so then when I moved to Endologics, which is more of a mid-sized, smaller company, um, and my team is very small in itself, like the regulatory affairs team is small. Um, now I get to work on a lot of different projects um, and kind of jumping around to different product lines as well. Uh, so I've had that um, because I'm not a smaller company, um, but I know that it just really depends on the role, the manager, um, and the company where it's at at the time. Great, thank you, Aaron. We can go ahead and move on to the next question. I'm gonna direct this to Jacob, but then I can generalize it to everyone else. Um, from John, he asks, what's the most valuable talent in, R in the R&D talent stack? And then for everyone else in your respective sectors, if you had to pick one particular talent or skill, um, is there one that particularly stands out to you? So we'll start with Jacob. I, I think you're muted, Jacob or very quiet at least. Okay, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I'm gonna take the easy answer out and say there's two. First one is ability to communicate. We've touched over this before, so, uh, so that one I'm not gonna be, spend too much time on. But the one that I really wanna focus on is uh, being hands-on. And again, this is very uh, particular to uh, maybe R&D engineering. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't develop products, you can't, uh, you know, push the boundaries on things without actually doing it yourself, uh, learning the process, you know, spending, putting the blood, sweat and tears into trying to be, make a piece of equipment run how you want it to run and do the thing that you want it to do and then fail multiple times and then, you know, try again and again and again. And again. That, that's how you learn. And uh, I think a lot of engineers, uh, especially in the R&D space, love the title of R&D. And, you know, the, like, you know, I, I think some people think it's a cool title, uh, but there's less engineers that are wanting to really, you know, put in the grind to do the R&D and to, uh, you know, do the due diligence to actually uh, develop products very well. So, uh, so when I look at someone's resume uh, trying to get into R&D, uh, you know, if they have manufacturing experience or, uh, other relatable experience that just gave them a lot of hands-on experience, or even a hit, you know, if if they uh, their outside hobbies, you know, I I've uh, been impressed with candidates that maybe uh, you know they put together synth synthesizers or Arduino boards, and uh, and they were very very hands-on that way. That tells me they're going to be the type of person that's going to be hands-on in this new application uh, in their new job. That's great. Thank you, Jacob. Susan, do you have anything to add in terms of, you know, if you were to hire someone, what's that one special skill or talent? Well, because I work in a, I've always worked in communications, um, or at least the, the latter part of my career has always been a focus in communications, whether it's medical communications or advertising or, or marketing. I have to tell you one thing that's a major buzzkill to me. If somebody sends in a resume with typos, with a company's name sprung, spelled wrong, with my name spelled wrong, um, and I think for me, that lack of attention to detail is really critical. And I've also been in a situation where I have been hiring and people just send their resume in regardless of the job. And I think, you know, it, that's really off-putting to me too, because it, it, you want to make sure that you're looking at people that are interested in the role that you have or the company that you have. Um, I think that those are a couple of things from a hiring manager's point of view 
that are really important. But I think a lot of the skills that we've talked about before, particularly that 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 either switching from one type of organization to the next, or switching, making a career switch, or starting all of the things that we've talked about, the kind of fundamental preparing for the interview is really important and showing how you can make that leap. I think Jacob brought a really great idea up of, you know, maybe they don't have this certain skill set, but they're doing things in their life that show that it's really um, applicable to the role. Thank you, Susan. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think um, for, for those of you kind of interested in marketing roles, I think the two biggest things um, that I really look for when, when looking at uh, resumes is just uh, showing the ability um, to build relationships with a lot of different types of people, um, just in various different projects, things like that. Like uh, with every type of role, whether it's engineering, quality, like ma manufacturing, marketing, whatever it is, relationships are very important. But the marketing role, it's a little different in that you're kind of in the center of the company, touching every single aspect um, and not really doing anything in any of the aspects, but you're kind of communicating with them constantly. Um, and I think being able to build relationships with a regulatory person um, to kind of push a document through or with a quality person to talk about the engineering side of things is very important. The second is strategic thinking, um, just being able to think about things at a very, very high level, but also having the ability to zoom in when necessary is another uh, big aspect of that marketing role. That's great. So I'm hearing. May I? May I I'm sorry, Joanne. May I just oh, for a second though? That's something that Aaron said. Um, is if you have an opportunity to get an internship, take it because I think it gives you that work experience. Because frankly, I think when you're first starting and you see a job title, you don't know really what it is. And I'll call out Justin. Justin, for example, was a intern with Cytokinetics, and he worked on my team. And the thing that I really liked that I thought was a very valuable quality is Justin asked a million questions. He had a number of interviews within, with, with people within the organization to understand what their role was and to, to better understand what the skills were that they were looking for. And I felt like that was a chance to really get in and, and use that time. And he did his work too, but, you know, but, but taking advantage of it, I think people, when they bring an intern in, have a level of understanding that they are building a career, starting a career. So I think, I think, Swarin, you talked about building relationships. I think that that is also really important, whether it's a, a full-time job or an intern job. And we're very glad and grateful to have Justin on our team too. So I'm hearing communication, you know, hard work, emphasizing delayed gratification for R&D, um, being detailed oriented, your care and attention to your application, making sure that you, you know, are taking the time to look at if you're a match to um, relationship development skills, networking abilities, and strategic thinking from the broad into the specific. So a lot of, you know, it's, 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 it's broad in the sense, but very specific uh, simultaneously to, um, you know, becoming a considered talent, if you will. So moving on to our next question, then um, we have one from John, who says, for everyone, um, what would you suggest to someone who is thinking of changing industries? And if you have any tips or suggestions on how to successfully transition, I think Deval, you might be able to add to this. Yeah, definitely. So I think in terms of transitioning or switching industries, um, one of the most important things is um, talking to people and understanding what they're doing in the industry you want to go into and then being able to bring that understanding to the interview um, when you do get that opportunity so you can showcase that yeah i may be coming from a different industry but i actually do know what's going on within your industry i may not have the experience but um, I, at least i know um, what goes on how how things happen um, because especially medical device industry i feel after having been in a few other industries is, is very unique and the way that it works, even the product development cycle um, and, and just the amount of time that it takes to bring a product to commercialization, it's, it's a very unique um, industry that, um, that if not many people would know much about if they, did, they if they haven't done their research. So 
researching is the one thing that I would really hone in on. Do you have a specific example of how you sold yourself? <laughs> how you made the sell? Um, to be very honest, in the very early, like in my very first um, job at, within the medical device industry, um, the way I really showcased myself was these are the projects that I've done. And then um, these are the skills that I've taken from these projects. Um, and it was an R&D position. So I had done a lot of hands-on activities within my undergraduate years. So I was able to say that, yeah, this was in electronics or this was in um, a different role, but I did CAD over here. I did um, XYZ over there, which will be applicable to the R&D role. Um, and, and that's kind of where I got my start, so. Thank you, Deval. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to jump in on, um, you know, switching industries? Yeah, I wanted to, I, I interview people every week in a, through another program um, at Saddleback. And we first start out giving the exact advice Susan says and Deval said, what did you learn in, in your real life? I had one woman say, I've been out of the job market for 15 years. And I said, are you a mom? She said, yes, I have three children. I said, okay, so when they ask you if you could multitask, all you have to say is, I'm a mom. So those experiences don't have to be directly from a prior professional position. It's your whole life experience. Um, I had one woman who had been working for diagnostic laboratories for years, and she wanted to get into regulatory. So she didn't she hadn't understood what her transferable skills were. So if you've been a manager somewhere and you've handled multi-million dollar projects, that skill doesn't go away because you change an industry, right? So those are the kinds of things when we talk to graduate students who know how to write a test protocol, who know how to analyze the results, who know how to format that into a peer-reviewed, accepted publication. Those are skills you don't leave, leave behind when you leave academia. Those are skills that if you're going for a clinical or regulatory writing job, you want to put at the forefront and tell your interviewer, not wait for them to ask you. So a lot of this is incumbent upon you to have a story about how those skills are transferable and applicable regardless of whether you stay in an industry or move to another industry. Thank you, Allison. I'll, I'll also jump in real quickly. Um, mirroring what was said previously about it not my, my, like to enter in with something that might not be your ideal role, uh, that's a great foot forward. And then I'll add to that, might not be your ideal company. Uh, I think an excellent way to get into uh, the medical device industry is to find you know a company that might not be the, you know, the biggest or the best in their particular area, but, you know, find some of those other companies and that do have those needs or does have openings and bam, you now have a medical device company on your resume and you're coming in from medical device much easier later to get into exactly the role and company that you want to go to. One of the other things too, that, that I have done through, looking through new roles is when I'm, when I'm actively looking, sometimes you have the opportunity for interviewing for a job that may not be what you, you are viewing as your ideal job. I'm a big fan of interviewing as many places as you can. One is you get to know more about the organization and their culture, but I also think the more that you interview, the better you get at it. Um, I, I, my way of learning is to write things down, is to type or write things down. And so I'll go through a job a job posting and go through and think about how am I going to answer the questions about the skills that they're looking for. So that's the way that I prepared myself. But I also am a big fan. I'm not going to interview for a job that is like ethically something I don't want to do or, you know, that I think has a really bad reputation in the, in the in industry. But I do think getting the chance to interview and practice interviewing. And Allison said, you know, she was talking about people about interviewing, I think that's really important. 
um, because it just makes you better at what you're doing. And, it, and for me, if I can go through the question that I think I'm gonna be asked first, it makes me more comfortable than when I actually get into the interview that it's gonna be, it, that I know the answer, or at least I think I know the answer. As a young individual, I, I feel very assured to know that even, you know, even someone like Susan has to like, you have to prepare uh, and practice and that nothing, not everything uh, comes naturally. And when you put it on the spot. Well, and I, you know, I'm in more senior roles and I've, I've, I've got a career that's, um, that I'm a, a tenured employee uh, or a seasoned employee. Um, but you do have to practice because the in it, the jobs that you're going into, they're going to expect more from you. As you get higher up into a roles and responsibilities, they'll expect more. So, yes, um, I think preparation is good at whatever level you're interviewing for. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, so we can go ahead and move on to a I mean, it's sort of adjacent to this to our discussion earlier, um, but I guess this is specific for Terry. Um, this Terry has been out of school for a while and uh, he or she wants to jump into regulatory affairs and quality. Um, do you have any recommendations on how to get experience? I think we've heard like volunteer, hop onto internships, um, anything else besides mm -hmm. that maybe uh, Alice can, can jump on or I see Deval unmuted. Sure, uh, uh, network. And I don't mean go out and ask people for a job. I mean, show up at a Device Alliance event like this, come to the Orange County Regulatory Affairs Association. We have programs every month and start meeting the people who were, you want to have as your peers. And you'll meet one and then you'll meet another and then you'll meet another. And Terry, I, I know that it's very difficult to volunteer now when we're not doing in-person events but that's just for now, it's not forever. Um, and we're all kind of getting used to this Zoom land. Um, but I, I encourage, especially the young professionals to reach out to people. If you meet someone like, I just met Chris, I think we've met before, but Chris and I are obviously of a like mind. We might've done the Vulcan mind meld at some point. So I'm going to follow up and reach out to Chris. I'm going to follow up with the panel and say, hey, great to see you guys. Justin and I haven't connected for a while. And it's, finding a job is a full-time job. And it's not just sending out blind resumes. So even in the times of remote connection, make connections. I have young people who have switched jobs during the pandemic and they're struggling because they can't make the face-to-face -face with their new boss. And it's like Chris said, you have to be proactive. You have to take the initiative. You have to say, do you want to have virtual happy hour? So you get the water cooler chit chat. Um, and it's so important. Um, I, I love Device Alliance when I first met because it opened me up to a whole new group of people. And I met some of those old R&D people I used to work with. So that's my advice. I was going to say, one of the easiest way to get into quality or uh, quality roles is um, if you have the opportunity and it, it makes sense for you being open to a contracting position to get that initial experience and then being able to um, take that experience and say that I have medical device, I have quality experience, and then go into a more full time position with that same company or a different company. Um, so that that would be one avenue. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to combine two sort of questions, um, one from our RSVP, but also one that San Juana had asked. Um, so what are sort of top two challenges that you're facing? And I don't know if you can sort of end up combining this with how do you ensure that you're still growing and developing in your career? You can start with maybe Erin. Sure. Um, so some challenges that I've been having lately is obviously everything's remote. Um, so I'm still technically new in my career. Um, I got a promotion last year. So it was kind of difficult to fill this new role when you're completely remote. And my manager was asking me to go on new projects, different product line, 
And it was really difficult to actually immerse yourself in the product line that's been on the market for 20 plus years when you can't actually physically see the product in your hand. You're trying to go based off of videos and documents and um, documents that were written 20 years ago. Um, so the history itself was difficult. Um, so really trying to learn new things has been really a challenge um, since everything you have to figure out where these documents live, maybe in our system. Um, you can't really just pop by someone's desk and be like, hey, I know you worked on this 20 years ago. Can you give me a little insight onto this? Um, so the little chit chat uh, within the company has definitely been a challenge and not being able to do that. Um, and then learning has been a little bit more challenging as well. Um, since you're completely remote, like you can't just uh, schedule slight uh, meetings with certain people. Uh, so that's been a little bit difficult. And then on the growth side, I guess, um, it, since we are by, all by ourselves now, it's giving me the opportunity to also just kind of dig around a little bit more. Um, so even though it's this vast location of documents in our systems, it has allowed me to kind of dig a little bit to make sure I am getting caught up on certain things um, and kind of just trying to learn things on my own as well, because I know it's been difficult to get together as teams um, and just communication in general, um, being able to communicate well has helped me make sure that I can continue to work well with my teammates. Um, so definitely communication has been ideal right now, I'm figuring out how to communicate in different ways. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Jacob, top two challenges, how do you keep growing? Yeah, uh, you know, honestly, my biggest challenge right now is it seems like the supply chain is backed up um, from suppliers. Uh, everyone has a crazy lead time. Uh, so, you know, trying to develop new products and try ideas uh, and learning, you know, and trying to fail quickly is a challenge uh, when, you know, you're trying to buy materials or equipment or things like that. And, and uh, you're faced with eight week long lead times on things. So, so that is my biggest challenge and headache right now. Um, and it's, it's also a newer thing. It, it used to be much shorter. Even a couple of months ago, it was half that. So uh, not sure really what's going on. Maybe someone with an economics degree can tell me. But um, uh, how do you keep growing? Um, you know, reading a lot. I think, you know, I, I, right now my job is really challenging me. So I feel like I'm really growing in my job. Uh, but uh, times when maybe my previous jobs, uh, I found, you know, you kind of learn the job very well and you're more cruising. Uh, it's just reading a lot of different things and reading things in your industry, watching YouTube videos on things in your industry, you know, especially in the med tech or cardiovascular space, uh, listening to talks from physicians. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of resources out there. And uh, uh, I, I think, you know, if, if you are interested in a certain industry, you can find a wealth of knowledge and, and then that gives you a tool set to be able to converse with other professionals in that industry and help you network. Thank you, Jacob. Susan, challenges you're facing and how are you staying uh, curious for growth? You know, I think uh, like all of us, we're probably faced with too much, time, too much work to do and not enough time to do it. Um, so I think you know, I think that's really a challenge where we're, we are running towards a product launch, uh, which is always a critical time. And there's a whole series of um, uh, milestones that we have to achieve. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge right now. I think it's really important to keep learning whatever role that you're in. I certainly am fortunate to have had some work experience, but there's new things to learn. Um, I'm really that I'm interested in. There are classes that I've tried to take online or there are um, organizations that I follow to read what's happening that are current um, uh, things in marketing and, and medical marketing in particular. So I think it's, and also asking people questions. I still ask a lot of questions. The woman that I, that I work for has a work experience that's very different than mine. And, and so she's given me some, some projects that are stress pro stretch projects, maybe stress projects, uh, but stretch projects for me. Um, that I feel really lucky to be able to, to, to take a bite into that and have her guidance and mentorship. Thank you, Susan. Deval? Some of the biggest challenges I would say right now are 
um, really just being able to connect with people, um, even though I'm going on site um, multiple times a week, but still a lot of other people are not being able, are not on site at that same time. Um, so I think that would be one of one of the challenges. And then the other one is um, the work-life balance. Con uh, when working from home, it's it's it almost seems as if there's a complete mixture um, between work and 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 life balance. But um, trying to figure that out, um, I think initially it was a big challenge, but now it's it's gotten. I I feel like I've at least figured that out um, for myself. So. Um, that's been one of the other things. And then in terms of how I've kept growing during this time, um, just being able to keep in touch with all of my mentors and also um, also trying new things and taking new classes um, is also one of the other things, kind of like what Susan mentioned. Um, so those are, so that that's that's about it, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to challenge both Soren and Allison. Soren, first, you have a minute. Tell us your challenge and how you Great. keep growing. I'll do this quickly. Um, so being in consulting, you're working with a lot of different types of clients in different states, different types of projects. Um, the truth is I haven't been exposed to all of those types of things. So really jumping into a project and have to quickly figure out what's going on, what is the market, what is the product, and I need to do that in a day or two. Um, so kind of getting that efficiency to, uh, that efficiency aspect together is kind of the most important part that I've been really learning how to do more and more. Done. Okay, is it my turn, Allison? Okay, missing the nuances of interpersonal interactions and unrealistic timelines because my regulatory colleagues, we all agree, your boss thinks you work 24 seven and you have nothing else to do, whether it's one project or multiple projects. Um, and to keep growing is participate in things like this. I mean, every opportunity you have, um, because, you know, like I said, it's all experience. It's not a good or bad, it's just all experience. Excellent. Thank you so much, Allison. And thank you all to all of our panelists for their time and excellent insights and obviously to the chat adding as well. Attendees, you know, please send a word of thanks to our panelists. Connect with them on LinkedIn. I'll send out all their LinkedIn um, profiles uh, via an email after this and on your way out if you can, um, if you found some value from this event. Uh, fill out our feedback form so we can be better in our in the future. And if you want to join us for Device Alliance, uh, I encourage you to go onto our website or contact me. Thank you again, everyone. <laughs>